The theme of our Wednesday Lenten services is God on trial. That the true Son of God would become truly human and be placed on trial and declared guilty for us. Tonight we see how Jesus' trial was affected by the misconceptions that so many had. The Bible reading that we consider together tonight is from Luke chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be a Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed him and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe, They sent him back to Pilate. And this is the word of the Lord. Have you ever had times when you felt that you were misunderstood? Someone took something that you said or did the wrong way, and no amount of explaining could convince them otherwise. They clung to their misconception about who you are and what you did, And that can hurt. Do you know who understands what you're facing at times like that? Someone who experienced the same thing. In today's Bible reading, we see how Jesus suffered far more than we can ever imagine because of the misconceptions that others had about him. It was very early on Good Friday morning and the Jewish leaders were taking Jesus away from his trial at the high priest's house. They were angry, so angry that they wanted to kill Jesus. But they couldn't because only the Roman governor could issue a death penalty. So they went to Pontius Pilate's palace. What was the crime that Jesus had done that had them calling for his life? He just told them that he was the promised Messiah, that one day they would see him at God the Father's right hand. And they were convinced that he was lying. Blasphemy, insulting God, they said. And for that, he did not deserve to live. That would hardly impress Pontius Pilate, who certainly would not care if somebody insulted the Jewish God that he did not believe in. So they had to come up with something that would get Pilate's attention. They said he's trying to cause a rebellion in the nation. He's telling people not to pay their taxes, and he wants to be a king. As Pilate looked at Jesus, who by this time had been spit on, and slapped around and whipped. He could see that Jesus was no threat to Emperor Caesar. And perhaps it was just for his own amusement that he asked, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus could not deny that, since he truly is the king of heaven. But Pilate was not interested in understanding what Jesus meant. But he could at least tell that there was no reason that he should be charged with any crime. 
And that should have been the end of the matter. But the religious leaders would not give up. They said he was stirring people up with his teaching, not only around Jerusalem, but all the way up north in Galilee. And suddenly Pilate thought he had a way to get Jesus and his accusers off his back because Herod, the ruler from up in Galilee, happened to be in Jerusalem that day. So he sent Jesus to Herod. Herod was happy about that, at least at first. He had heard some impressive things about Jesus, and maybe Jesus would do a miracle for him. But Jesus did not even speak in his presence. Herod likely had no idea that his father had tried to kill baby Jesus 33 years earlier when he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem and broke the heart of any family with a baby boy. I don't know if Herod was bothered by what he had done to John the Baptist. When John the Baptist told him he had to repent, Herod locked him up in prison and then foolishly put him to death. And now standing right in front of Herod was the only one who could save him from that sin and from all of his sins. But Herod had no interest in that. All he wanted from Jesus was a personal miracle show. And when Jesus would not deliver, Herod and his soldiers let loose. They mocked him dressed him up in an elegant robe. Jesus had come to save them. And they laughed at him and sent him away. Their misconception cost them dearly. Do you know people who have misconceptions about Jesus? Are there some who maybe just have trouble understanding why Jesus is important to you, that they cannot grasp why you make worship a high priority in your life and then that you would actually come an extra time during the week. There are some who get angry if you want to talk to them about Jesus. Their consciences are telling them that there is something in their life that they need to address. And they think of Jesus as a threat to their way of life. Their misconception keeps them from understanding that Jesus is not there to threaten them, but to give them freedom and peace. And there are others who pretend not to care, or at least that's what they keep on telling themselves, because they don't want to deal with those things that they don't want to believe are real. Those are tragic misconceptions that keep them from seeing the reality of God's love for them in Christ. But what about us? Do we have misconceptions about Jesus? Are there times that we would like Jesus to use his power for our advantage to quickly heal an illness? or to take away a challenge from our life, or to give us a blessing that would make our lives easier. And then, when those things don't happen, Satan is quick to suggest that Jesus must not be much of a Savior at all. Are there times that we are willing to receive from Jesus good things, like forgiveness of our sins, but then aren't so interested in using his power to fight against sin in the future? Are there times that we hear Jesus' call to grow in his grace, to hear and to read and to learn and to study his word, but we want to put off that concern for another time, like Pilate who was hoping he could just push Jesus away? We know better. But our sinfulness distorts our view of Jesus and what we need from him. Pilate and Herod did not understand Jesus at all. But there was one thing that they had no misconception about. They could see he had not done anything to be condemned. They knew he was not guilty. And they should have had the courage to say, this court is adjourned. 
right then and there. But Jesus remained there at his trial. Now remember, by this time, he had been awake all night. He had been repeatedly beaten and purposely misunderstood. See him there, your God, on trial. What kept him there in that courtroom? It was not the ropes around his hands and feet that kept him there. It was not the muscles of the guards or Pontius Pilate's threats that confined him to that courtroom. Why did Jesus remain there? It was his love for you and for me. He had no misconception about what they were plotting to do to him. Jesus knew that by remaining there, he was on his path to the cross. Remarkably, that is where he desires to go because he knows who he is and why he has come. He is there, our God on trial, because God our Savior wants all people to be saved. He is there, our God on trial, because there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So please let there be no misconception about this. Jesus is on trial in our place. We are guilty of sin and we are deserving of eternal pain and death. And instead of allowing God's judgment to come in our direction, Jesus put himself between us and God's just punishment for our sin. He took our sin upon himself and was condemned in our place. He is there, our God on trial, our substitute, our Savior. Also, let there be no misconception about what that means for you and for me and for all. May we always see clearly who Jesus is and what he has come to do for us and for others too. Jesus may not use his power to answer our every prayer the way that we would like it, but he will do for us exactly what he knows we need. He is the one who washes away every sin. He is the one who alone can silence Satan's accusations. He is the one who became covered with our sin so that he might wrap his righteousness around us that we may be declared holy and blameless in God's sight, his own dear child. He is the one who sets us free from sin, that we may have peace with God and rejoice in his saving love and live to his glory for others to see. There are still many in our world with misconceptions about Jesus. Can Jesus use us to show them who he really is? What can clear up the misconceptions that others have about Christ? Only the word of God. The same word of God that the Holy Spirit has used to open our eyes of faith. In these words of God that we've studied together today, we are blessed to see that this one on trial is our God and our Savior. This is God's saving gift of love to us. And now it is our gift to share with others so that they too may understand how much God truly loves us all. Amen.